This is a C News report at noon. I am Karen Kuse Philip. Topping the news at this time, the company at the center of the fake oil controversy, A and V Oil and Gas, has sued opposition leader Kamala Prasad Bisesa. This comes one week after the company sent out a pre-action protocol letter seeking an apology from her. The claim was filed in the San Fernando High Court on Wednesday. Peter Christopher tells us more. In a release to the media on Thursday, it was confirmed that the CEO of ENV, Hanif Bash, had filed a legal action against the opposition leader. He filed the claim for libel against the opposition leader in the San Fernando High Court on Wednesday. The company claims that the Sapari MP made defamatory statements in speeches at the UNC meetings on Sunday 10th, September 2017 and Monday 18th, September 2017. The release also stated the claim for damages is also in respect of defamatory statements which she published and which she continues to publish on Facebook, YouTube and social media. At those meetings, the opposition leader, while quoting a Petrochin internal audit, made statements which suggested the company had billed Petrochin for oil which was never produced, prompting the fake oil scandal. Last week, the company sent a pre-action protocol letter requesting that Separia MP Kamala Prasad Bisesa issue an apology or retraction of her statements. The opposition leader's attorneys responded to the pre-action protocol letter defending her statement claiming nothing said was defamatory. The company, however, contends that her statements were neither legal nor factual. The Children's Authority of Trinidad and Tobago has condemned the brutal attack on a mother and her 12-year-old child who was allegedly molested by a male relative. After a visit to the mother and child, the authority reports that both remain warded in critical condition. In a release, the authority praised the child's mother who took immediate action and reported the abuse once it was brought to her attention. The necessary counseling and interventions will be provided to the family given the traumatic experience. Parents and guardians are reminded that if children are actively engaged about their day and feel comfortable sharing their views, they are more likely to disclose any incidents or concerns they may have. All reports of abuse should be made to the police at 999 and the authorities' hotlines at 996 or 800-2014. Well, that press release is in relation to this incident where a mother and her 12-year-old daughter were hospitalized early on Wednesday morning after they were both stabbed. Seniors was told the child was allegedly being molested by a male relative before the stabbing incident took place. Here's Rishi Harinanan's report on that incident. Reports say at around midnight, the mother of the girl caught the man molesting her. The suspect allegedly left the house at St. John's Village, San Fernando, and returned with a knife and stabbed the two. One witness said he heard the commotion on the road, and when he came out, he heard someone saying, call the police. When we came out, we saw a woman and her child lying on the ground there, and um, she was claiming that the person she lives with here stabbed her and stabbed the girl as well. He said assistance was given to the mother and child before the ambulance and police came. What we saw was the girl got stabbed close to her chest and the woman got it on her legs and her arm. The witness went on to claim the child may have been interfered with by the relative before. The, the child claimed that the incident was happening a while now and I don't know if she was scared to come out and say or, or come out and tell the, the mother that it was happening. But this incident is very saddening to see something like this happening in this area because this area is a very quiet area. The residents around here are very civilized. The mother and daughter are in stable condition at hospital. The man was later found not too far from the home where the incident took place. It is said he drank a poisonous substance. This is a CNews Live report at noon. Remember, you can keep up to date with all the latest news on our website at ctvtt.com or you can check out our Facebook and Twitter pages at CNews Live. To some crime news now, a 31-year-old Kumuto man will face a Sangre Grande magistrate this morning to answer charges in connection with the abduction and sexual assault of a 16-year-old schoolgirl. The man was charged yesterday with three offenses, sexual touching, sexual penetration and abduction, 
after police received instructions from Director of Public Prosecutions Roger Gaspard. Last Tuesday, the teenager was reportedly washing clothes behind her Komuto home when she was taken by a man who dragged her into the Komuto forest. He allegedly took her to a shack where the acts were allegedly committed. Police carried out a manhunt for the suspect, rescued the girl and detained the suspect who was found guarding the victim. Officers of the Northern Division conducted extensive inquiries into the incident and yesterday submitted a file to Gaspard for instructions. A man has been shot dead in Coover. Details are still coming in, but CNews understands that 23-year-old Anand Gulcharan of Grant Street, Coover, was shot dead as he made his way to work. Gulcharan, a hospital attendant at the Coover Health Facility, was shot at around 7.30 a.m. near the car park of the facility. He died at the scene of the shooting. Police are still at the scene of the shooting at this time. To other news now, Emil Elias has resigned as the chairman of state-owned telecommunications services of TNT, TSTT, and its wholly owned subsidiary, Massey Communications, with immediate effect. Elias issued a five-page resignation letter on Wednesday, citing challenges his construction company, NH International Caribbean Limited, as the motivating factor in his resignation. He said the company is now facing unexpected challenges, which require me to devote far more time to its future, according to TSTT sources. He stressed that the unexpected challenges was not related to the economic downturn. When contacted, Mr. Elias confirmed the resignation and said he had no further comment to add to what had already been placed in the public domain. According to reports coming out of Dominica, 15 residents from the southern community of Point Michel have died as a result of Hurricane Maria, which devastated the island on Monday night. This has brought the overall death toll to 24, the Caribbean News Service reports. According to a well-known resident, the situation in that community, he described it as total devastation. 15 dead, 90% of roofs gone. All movement out of Point Michel is by foot, he said, and four have been buried so far. The rest are unaccounted for. A family of seven was swept down by a ravine and only a grandson's body was retrieved. He was buried on Tuesday. It is also confirmed that one female from the community of Stock Farm also perished. And in related news, Dominica's Prime Minister Roosevelt Scarrett is scheduled to make his first public address following the passing of Hurricane Maria. A social media post by the Antigua Barbuda Broadcasting Services said Prime Minister Scarrett was scheduled to land in Antigua at 11.30 this morning. The Prime Minister is also expected to meet with Dominican nationals at the Dean William Lake Cultural Center. While the Trinidad and Tobago Defense Force has confirmed that supplies were sent to Dominica via the Trinidad and Tobago Coast Guard on Wednesday. A release from the TTDF said the TTS Maruga CG-27 left for Dominica at 7.45 a.m. on Wednesday with relief supplies inclusive of food, water, generators, and many more items which were donated and collected from various stakeholders and locations across the country. The TTDF also wishes to inform the public that they can drop off relief items for persons affected by Hurricane Maria and the following locations. The cruise ship complex, TT Post, Piaco, Is There Not a Cause at Anderson Street in St. James, Tribes Mass Camp at Rosalino Street, Woodbrook, the Living Water Community on Frederick Street, the Regimental Headquarters in Aranguez, Camp Serret in Laramain, Camp Signal Hill in Tobago, and Milford Road, base of the Coast Guard in Tobago. The cancelled passenger ferry, the Ocean Flower 2, has arrived in Trinidad. News of the Ocean Flower 2's arrival started on social media before opposition MP Rushton Parry made the announcement that it was here. He did this during a meeting of the Joint Select Committee, which is being held to discuss the inter island ferry issues. Sherilyn Lewis reports. Passenger ferry started Wednesday morning on social media. Mobile ship trapping app have the Ocean Flower 2 heading to Shagaramas. It was MP for Mayor Rushton Pare who serves as Vice Chair of the Joint Select Committee to inquire into the state of the ferry service in Trinidad and Tobago, who revealed the ferry was here. Perhaps from my information, 
you may not have to wait too long because I understand the ocean flower is docked in Shagramas as we speak. So we, you may be having a solution very, very soon to, to deal with it. Photos and videos of the ferry followed online, but seniors contacted Minister of Works and Transport Rohan Sinanen. He stated he could not confirm or deny if the vessel was docked in Shagaramas, but he did say if it is here, it has nothing to do with the Port Authority or the government. In August, the contract for the Ocean Flower 2 passenger ferry was cancelled due to a delay in the arrival of the vessel, despite an extension by the Port Authority of Trinidad and Tobago. The Ocean Flower 2 was supposed to help salvage Trinidad and Tobago's dysfunctional inter-island ferry service. Since the cancellation of the ferry, the lease operator Bridgman's defended its reputation and said if it did not agree that the cancellation of the contract is valid, the Canadian firm, which also has the contract for the Cabot Star cargo vessel, said it's considering its options and how to move forward. Last week, Minister Sinanan said that tenders were out for the acquisition of a new passenger ferry in light of the cancellation of the contract for the Ocean Flower 2. Sherilyn Lois, C News. Well, the Ministry of Works and Transport responded to the issue, saying that it is cognizant of the presence of the Ocean Flower 2 passenger vessel in the waters of Trinidad and Tobago, but that its presence is related to a dry docking exercise undertaken by its owner. The Ministry reiterated the presence of the vessel in TNT is not related to the terminated contract between the Ministry and the owner of the vessel. As to the comments being made regarding the standby letter of credit which was signed by the Port Authority of Trinidad and Tobago as part of the previous contractual engagement with Bridgman's Services Group for the charter of the Ocean Flower II, the Ministry is assuring the public that such letter of credit cannot be drawn down by Bridgman's Services Group as a result of the termination of this contract by the Ministry. It said the letter of credit will come to an end in September 2018 and that the, that should be September 2017 and that the interests of the public are not in any way exposed or compromised. Let's take a look now at the weather for the period this afternoon. Trinidad and Tobago will see sunny conditions interrupted at times by light to moderate showers in a few areas. There is a chance of one or two of these showers becoming heavy and thundery in a few confined localities. In the event of a heavy shower or thunder shower, winds may become gusty and street or flash flooding is likely to occur in areas so prone. Seas are expected to be normal while waves are expected to be 2 meters and 1 meter in sheltered areas. <music> Former U.S. State of California Attorney General Daniel Lundgren hopes the 2017 Caribbean Security Forum currently taking place at the Hyatt Regency will bear fruit. He was speaking at the opening of the forum aimed to developing strategies to curb the global and national threats. The purpose of the forum is to bring all of these disparate parts together, all of these actors together, and somehow come up with a committed plan of action. And I will tell you, in my judgment, this will be a failure. This forum will be nothing but a nice meeting of people for two days, a nice breakfast, a nice lunch, if all we do is come up with a white paper that sits on shelves. He added the crime situation has also placed the wrong people behind bars. It always strikes me that in that equation, something is wrong with a society that requires its senior citizens to peer out from windows that have bars on them, while those that should be behind bars are outside doing whatever they want to do. Two other news now. President of the Sheep and Goat Farmers Association, Shiraz Khan, says more has to be done to encourage the agriculture sector. He said many youngsters were turned off the, in the industry for various reasons. We got to make agriculture more sexy, more attractive. We cannot continue in the same vein, right? To, to, to encourage people into our sector. Okay, take for instance in the media, all right, just sure. some people look at you, 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 you dress up nice, you could talk to people, you, you people seeing you, right? Some people will feel motivated to be like you and many of the others. Who want to be like the farmer?
Mr. Khan said farmers were also at a disadvantage because their costs had increased while their prices remained the same. Every morning you get up and you go to the pharmaceuticals place or the feed shop, some price is going up. And our prices remain the same. Nobody cares about that. They want you to continue to remain poor. Because that is what it is. Because I have been selling my, my goat milk at $60, at $30 a litre for the past five years. If I raise my price, nobody's going to buy it. Not even the appearance on the pitch of coach Stern John could spare the blushes of the Central Sharks who crashed a 2-0 defeat to neighbors and second place W Connection. But the win wasn't enough to help the Savonetta boys overtake leaders Northeast Stars who also had a similar 2-1 win over resurgent Club Sandu outfit as Pro League action invaded the Atto Bolden Stadium last evening. Sando's recent form suggested that they were not to be taken lightly and they almost broke the game wide open with two good looks here only to be denied at every turn. Then at the other end, Northeast hit pay dirt when Denzel Chobo's wicked free kick flew in on the half hour mark to give the Stars the one to nothing lead at the break. Nothing Kelvin Henry could do about that debut goal for Bleeder. They turned it up a notch in the second half and Rondon Winchester was cursing his luck here as Henry denied him a sure goal. They should have added another here when this low cross from Akim Garcia was crashed onto the bar by Jamil Neptune when scoring looked simpler. But Winchester had his back as he went solo, took on a heap of defenders and almost without warning fired a bullet past Henry for 2 to nothing on the hour mark, stars cruising now. Then it went from bar to worse for Sando when Jason Joseph's clumsy tackle on Winchester was punished by referee Michael Mohammed with a second yellow and eventually red, forcing him to have to leave the field in the 76th minute. But they couldn't take advantage of their superior numbers, and Stars walked off 2 nothing winners and still leaders in the TT Pro League. That's because W Connections battled holders Central FC and wasted a host of good chances. But the Sharks almost broke the deadlock when this effort flashes across the face of Jelani Archibald's goal. Still, connections kept probing, but they couldn't find a way past current season in goal for the Sharks. That's until the 34th minute, when Neil Benjamin Jr. popped up at the back post to keep the play alive, and he finishes with some assurance to break the deadlock with his eighth of the season. Still, the Sharks responded and came close themselves, only to find Archibald ready and waiting. And just before the half, they came close again, and this cross somehow we lose everyone in the area and ran out to safety to keep it on one to nothing connections at the interval. The Sharks tried to find the equalizer, but again, Archibald was standing tall in goal for connections. And then their best chance came as a result of a defensive blunder, but Archibald's blushes were spared when the shot went up and over. But in an ill-advised throw-in, it puts the pressure on the defender who was always going to be second best to Marcus Joseph who took advantage and made it 2 to nothing in the 76th with his sixth of the season. There was no further scoring in this one and Connections kept up the pressure on Northeast Stars with a similar 2 to nothing victory over the Central Sharks. Well, that's it for sport. And that brings us to the end of the C-News report at noon. I'm Karen Kuse Philip. Remember, for up-to-date and breaking news throughout the day, you can visit the CNews website at ctvtt.com. Do have a good afternoon.